Good afternoon and thanks for joining us for this kickoff to our 2020 Masterclass series, which will be um, revolving around the theme of essentialism. The reason we've chosen essentialism is because I think you guys are probably like me, that you feel like incoming is hitting you from everywhere. This, this social media, this parent, this complaint, this employee, blah. Um, and so what we want to focus on this year is really what to pay attention to because we can't pay attention to everything and the art of narrowing the incoming down to what to pay attention to is uh, not easy. Our keynote speaker at our shift conference coming up in just about five weeks is the author of the book Essentialism, Greg McEwen, and we're excited to have him. We'll also host a book signing for him. So come join us if you're not registered. I think we have very few seats left. As a matter of fact, I expect within the week we'll be doing a sold out um, e-blast. So grab your seat if you haven't already. Join us for that. And I'll mention other content as we go throughout this update on the status of the industry, which is how we kick off the year every year. We have built our curriculum for SHIFT around what we believe to be important in the industry. And basically that's what we hear from you guys. So we're not over here making it up. We don't know, we're not in the trenches with you. We're supporting you as you're in the trench. And what you say to us is important is what we pay attention to. So welcome and I'm happy to have you here. Let's, um, we are going to do uh, some content first. And then we are going to leave time for some questions at the end. You can hover over your um, the top of your screen and the bar will show up. That will give you the ability to ask questions. Feel free to ask those as we go or wait till the last couple of minutes. I've got a lot to talk about, so hopefully we will get to that. And if we don't, give us your questions anyway and we'll answer them after. So first of all, we want to tell you about a couple of things that's going on in Hinge. We want to talk about trends in two respects. We want to tell you what we hear is going on in the world of early education operations. We want to then tell you what we see as a transactional team and the trends there. And then we want to tell you what's happening in the future with us and what we hope to support you with so we can get some feedback and plug you in there. Uh, we have, this is a very popular um, content. We can see you guys are inter as interested as we are. We have almost 200 people on today. We didn't have, we have so many registrations. We didn't have the opportunity to tell you uh, the states and the countries that they come from. But uh, thank you again for joining us. And we're happy to see such a diverse group of people. We've got people from our investment community, We've got people from our real estate community. We have national companies represented here. We have large regional companies. We have churches. We have individual owners all across the country. And that makes for a very lively conversation. And it's also our hope that that's what shows up at Shift because we like to uh, look at the industry as a whole. So a couple of things happening over here at Hinge. We're just as busy as you guys are. Um, we have added in a new service and a new layer of our company infrastructure that started last year, and we're happy to announce to you guys that we have created a new division of people who are current or former business owners who will be a, a handhold support team for our sellers as they go through a transaction. So we're very mindful of how difficult that transaction can be. Our brokers are fabulous at explaining things and staying in touch and helping deal with, um, frankly, the drama because it, it can be very dramatic and time consuming. But we wanna add a second person in with that team to talk to the seller about what's going on operationally, do a lot of listening, to be on site to help with things, to talk about things like, should I increase tuition rates while I'm selling? What do I do with this team member? Help you keep your enrollment high and just support you in general. So we commissioned last year, Molly Petchel, 
And Kathy Petchel, Molly is our duty expert in marketing concepts. Kathy is our expert in staffing concepts. And they are just blowing us away with the work that they're doing with sellers. Um, so more about that, we plan to expand that team during 2020 and just really excited about how it's going. So we're happy to let you know about that. I mentioned our, ma our masterclass theme this year, which is also our keynote for SHIFT, uh, the premise of essentialism. And again, essentialism is just recognizing that we have limited time and money um, and how to use that to be its most effective. I would suggest that you guys, I first learned of Greg McEwen through a Tim Ferriss podcast where he interviewed Greg. And I think it was one of the most powerful podcasts I've ever heard. So if you can't get to the book and it's really difficult, do like I do and get on the treadmill and plug your ears in and listen to Tim interview Greg McEwen. There were some fantastic ideas for me in there during this was the end of 2018 that I continue in practice and it set my 2019 and now 2020 years off really well. So highly recommend that. Also, I have mentioned a couple of times our Shift Child Care Leaders Conference. Um, there you see Greg McEwen over there with his book. Uh, we also, our second keynote is Joe Kirshner, the CEO at Primrose, who you see in the upper right hand corner. We're excited to hear from the franchise community this year. And we have five shifters who are people who are doing really cool things in their child care companies. We have four or five content or key our main stage speakers and 12 breakout sessions. And we're so excited about the quality of those. We will, we will center very largely around uh, what I'm going to talk to you guys about as we go that are the main themes going through uh, business owners right now. So I'll mention those as we go. That's what's happening. That's happening in the world. First of all, what do we see happening across the country operationally? What are people doing to change their companies, to keep them relevant, to stay fresh, and to keep up with the competition? I have in my 30, I don't know, I'd have to do the math, let's say four years, never seen as much change in what is going on inside schools as I have in the last three, maybe four years. And today's parent group just really um, requires and pushes us to a new level in how to communicate, how to support them, in addition to the amount of competition entering the industry because of its very high performance right now. So there's your bottom line. Let's see how that breaks down. First of all, we have the lowest unemployment rate since uh, in the last 50 years, which means parents are working and occupancies and enrollments are high. If you don't have a full school right now, there's your first objective. Do some diagnostics and figure out why your schools are not full. There could be some legitimate reasons, but you need to figure that out. Work with some consultants. We're happy to give you opinions. But in this market, if your school is not full, it probably never will be. Maybe you have an upper level management issue. So I'm a firm believer in so goes the director, so goes the school. Maybe you are in a market where the competition is high and you need a sizzle in your curriculum to differentiate yourself. Maybe you're in an older facility and you need a refresh to keep relevant with a new competition of bright and shiny that's being built in your market. I don't know what the issue is, but there is an internal issue for you to look at. I don't need to come see you or talk to you to know that. And I know maybe this sounds a little harsh, but sometimes I really like to uh, be frank with you guys because I want, don't want you to waste your time on the wrong things. It's, it's important to identify where your issues are and focus there first. So if your school is not full, in this economic environment, there's where you start. Get some help, identify it, figure out how to make an investment and get there. Second thing is if you are a company that participates in subsidy 
tuition. In other words, you get revenue sources from other than parent pay resources. Those subsidies on the federal level are stable and rising. Now, there's always somebody that feels like they want to throw something at me when I say this because they might be in an area where the state has some volatility in their funding. So some of this, the um, child development block grant, which is the first one we mentioned here, which is the main source of income-based subsidy help for families that don't have the resources to pay for childcare, on the federal level has always been stable in the 25 years of its existence and risen. It doubled two years ago from 26 to $52 billion. Where you see the volatility is states will then choose to match or not match. They can match at whatever level they choose. And sometimes states funding uh, is a little more volatile and runs out. And then you have parents with problems accessing funds. But on the federal level, it's very stable and believed to be <coughs> All three of these programs I'll mention right here don't seem to be political party influence. They seem to be pretty stable in Washington, no matter who's there. So you can count on that as a revenue source. The second one is Head Start has been around for about 50 years. Head Start is very stable. Sometimes they will compete with you. Sometimes they will work with you and you're able to access that funding. I'll talk about that in a little more detail in just a minute. And the last one is the USDA food program. We find a lot of our clients hesitant to participate in the food program because it's quite administrative and it does take a good bit of work um, for paperwork and administration, but completely worth it. If your school has subsidy levels up to about 30%, you most likely qualify and all of the food, typically at, at that level, it will bring in enough revenue to pay for the food for the entire school. So we are a big believer there. Even if you outsource the administration, that'll cost you 10 to 15% of your revenue, do it because it's certainly worth the money. So excited that those three programs remain stable. I mentioned Head Start. Historically, the public schools and Head Start and outside sources other than private uh, facilities were a little stingy with their money. We're all stingy with their money, so we get it. What we've seen in the last, let's say, five to eight years is that Head Start and more specifically early Head Start, which is infants and toddlers and twos, is now collaborating more with private school uh, centers. And the way that they collaborate is that they have a lot of money and they don't often have enough space to house all of the children they need to. So they will work with local providers to put a classroom in their school. You might provide that the teachers in that class to their specifications, they will equip it. I've seen them do capital improvements to buildings. I've seen fantastic playgrounds installed. And if you're interested in this, what we believe the best way to do this is the Head Start funds flow into your county to a nonprofit organization and they make the decision on how the funds get spent. Find out who the head of that organization is in your county, get to know them, just give them a call. Hey, we know you're doing some great things over there at Head Start. We're doing some great things here too. I don't know how we might work together, but can you come visit, we'd like to show you what we're doing. Can you grab a cup of coffee? Let's get to know each other. So that decision is, is made on the local level and it's a relationship decision as most are. So that's what we suggest there. But we are very happy to see Early Head Start and Head Start funds in collaboration with our private providers. So um, more and more, and this is getting to be more and more real, and we have a very um, specific panel that we're excited about at Shift relating to this. So we, we hear very often the threat of competition from, let's say, I call it unfair sources. 
And the reason I call it unfair sources is they aren't under the same financial constraints that most privately owned schools are. So let's say they're the public school, they could be housed in a church building, they could be a nonprofit that doesn't pay taxes or has a free building to sit in. They could receive public money like the public schools, your tax dollars. And although we're not seeing this implemented broadly and consistently across the US, what we are seeing is that when it does happen, and there are things from a full blown infant to four year old school on a public school campus, it's devastating for local providers because free is almost impossible to compete with. So one of the things that we have is the three person panel. There is an organization nationally called ECEC and Chad Dunkley, the CEO at New Horizons, Joe Kirshner, CEO at Primrose, and Dave Goldberg, CEO at Cadence Education, have asked us, and of course we said yes please, if they could share some information with our guests about the work that they're doing globally, but also to put some resources in the hands of people who might have this happen to them in their local community and need some immediate resources to be able to participate when these programs come out. Because they often happen quickly, you don't know that they're happening, one day you wake up and all of your threes and fours are gone to the public school or their infants leaving and it can be devastating. So we want to arm you with the information and the resources that you need when this happens. So more on that. This is a big change. This was added in this year. So if you join us regularly for update on the industry, over the last couple of years, you've seen some familiar trends. This is a new one. It's not a new one, but it's a new one that we're talking more strongly about because it is um, happening more and more of a concern to people. <coughs> you are going to be so shocked about this one, but there continue to be struggles with staffing and staff culture. So I'm being sarcastic, of course. This is now. So when you want to be upset that you can't hire enough staff and that they're really difficult to work with and the work culture is terrible and you just don't know how to deal with these people, remember that the trade-off is you won't have a full school. So here, here's, and we've been through both, right? Unless you're very new in the industry. In a time of low unemployment, our schools are full because parents are working. But low unemployment means it's very competitive for staff. In a time where unemployment is not as low, then not, it's hard to get enrollments and teachers are everywhere. I promise you, if you haven't been through both, you want what's going on today. So you'd much rather have a full school because there are strategies to hire and to manage and to grow and mentor and create a wonderful staff culture. So you will see a lot of content at Shift related just to this. We have, come in, we have indeed coming back for the second year, so popular last year, with very concrete information about how you can use their platform and others to hire. We have five or six main stage and breakout speakers talking to you about how to hire, what you do before people come to work, how you get them engaged at work, how you build a long-term career plan, how do you conduct an effective staff meeting? How do you grow them? Um, this is so this a lot of our content and our whole our last day is a half day. And this is the third year in a row that we dedicated that entire half day to staffing strategies. You're going to hear from an HR manager from one of our private equity companies. You'll hear from our own Kathy Petchel with some great strategies. We're just really excited about the content we're bringing. But when you want to bang your head against the wall on this one, and I'm with you, I want to do it too at times. So it's not that it's not real. It's just not the worst problem you could have. So there are strategies, learn them, figure them out and work with them. So this is one that I love. So we are of course high in occupancy and there's a lot of competition coming in and that means we have to make more of an investment in our school. 
I am your advocate for tuition rates and reducing discounts and getting paid for the work that you are doing. So I'm not unsympathetic to the cost of care for young families. I have children who have young children and I get it, the, there is a real struggle, but they have advocates everywhere. If I hear one more or see one more article that says, early education is now more expensive than university. And I wanna scream, well, good, it ought to be. Do you really want to pay more for your 18 year old to sit in a class with 60 students or for your infant to have one uh, teacher for four children and your infant can't speak to you and requires much more care? Why do we think it's such a terrible thing? And does every child need to go to university? Is that a requirement? No. Do we know that birth to four are the most critical learning years? So I can really get on this soapbox. Do you see where I'm going? So I am your advocate because I think we're our own worst enemies in charging for the what you're actually providing. And I want to talk a little bit about discounting. So um, what I want to say on the charging what you're providing is that your expenses, I don't have to know you or your school finances. I have tracked financial trends in this industry for 34 years, and we get financial statements all the time from the national groups, the large regional groups. You heard me say it earlier. We don't share those, they're confidential, but we have a financial model. We're happy to share it with you, where you input your tuition rate and your license capacity and the expense fields will populate and show you what the average school that looks like yours spends in each category. You have to be mindful that not every school is exactly the same, but it's a, it's a great benchmark. What we found historically is that business owners are timid to raise rates. The fear of losing people is always worse than reality. Directors absolutely hate it because they have to listen to parents. And that's real, you know, it, it really is. Parents are struggling and you don't want to hear it. You don't want to listen to it. You love them. You don't want to cause them pain. But also you got into this business as a mission to provide services for children and families. If you don't practice self-care and take care of yourself by charging what you are actually providing, you cannot be effective to those hundred families and, and team members. If you don't get paid for what you're providing, you cannot reinvest in expanding services to more families that desperately need it. So it's not just a nice thing, it's a requirement. So I'm very pushy on this. I know that over the last three years, you've had to start paying more for incoming team members. At one point I tracked it at about 10% more, and that was about 18 months ago. My guess is the number's higher, but I don't know what it is right now, so I can't quote it. But the point is you are paying more for incoming team members. That means that your seasoned team members also have to go up, right? They can't now be at your um, entry rate. So your expenses are going up quickly, and I'm finding people to be too timid about increasing their tuition rates to go along with it. I said there's more confidence, maybe there is some, but not to the level I'd like to see it. One of the tips I have for people is really look at what you're discounting, because that can be a hidden danger in you knowing how financially strong your school is. So here's the danger. When people measure their success, they typically count the heads in the building, they come up with a FTE, a full-time equivalent, by comparing the number of full-time and part-time heads to their capacity. Oh, we're 80% full, we're cool. Well, how many of those 80% are paying you? And how many are paying you your full rate? So here's some quick things to look at. And I would, if you want to know more about either one of these two things, you can reach all of our former master classes on our website at hingebrokers.com. There is a whole master class on tuition rate setting. <clears throat> there is a whole master class on discounting because it's very important. 
And often making a change with discounting will get you farther than a huge tuition rate or doing a lower tuition rate increase along with reducing some discounts is easier. So let me hit you with the discounts quickly. Staff discounts. I don't think we're going to get rid of those anytime soon in this industry, and I wouldn't want you to. Staff don't make enough money. It's a great way to attract them. What I will say to you is look at the number you're discounting. There are some new trends. So historically, we would discount 100% of directors' children tuition and half of teachers' children's tuition. There are some new trends to limit that to two children per team member. Also, to not discount infants and toddlers because you're losing money in those programs, most likely. There are very few areas in the country where you're able to charge the tuition to break even on those programs. They're typically just help you enroll your school and get siblings, and they age up into more profitable age groups. Um, some schools will limit the total number of children that can be discounted. This one's kind of tough because you need a new three-year-old teacher and she's got a child. Are you really going to say, I don't have a half-price slot? But for a school license for $150, about 10 free or discount slots is about all you can tolerate unless your tuition rates are high enough to support that. That's another employee benefit is what it is. You have to be able to afford it. <coughs> Excuse me. Second thing, multiple children in the same family. I'm seeing a trend away from this in a lot of markets. I would caution to find out what your competition is doing. Kind of the norm is 10 to 20% off the less expensive tuition rate. Um, but consider it. If you're in a higher end market, you could very well uh, get away from this. With all tuition rate or policy changes, always communicate really well. We have a tuition rate increase coming up this fall and also do it every year, set a precedence. Your expenses go up every year. Don't, you know, do it every September, every January, every April, whenever you do it. I don't have a strong preference. Um, I don't see it work better at one time or another. But let people know that you're gonna do it, but communicate it with, here's why, we are going up in tuition. Here's what we accomplished last year. We did this new playground. We implemented a new curriculum. We did teacher training. We're now paying teachers more. We want higher quality for your children. In this coming year, we're going to do these things. We need to increase tuition rates from this to this. In conjunction with that, we will eliminate the multiple child discount. Another thought before you panic, which you could also do, and I, I really like, is grandfather current families at a lower tuition rate increase and maybe a discount, call them legacy families. Now they're special, they're getting a, a, a good benefit. And anyone new, you can do anything different. You can eliminate discounts, you can have a higher tuition rate. And I have people all the time say, well, what if they talk to each other? Well, what if they talk to each other? You know. Uh, your legacy families have been there a long time and they've earned your loyalty and you gave them something special. You don't have to explain that any more than that. I don't know why that would be a problem. So multiple children in the same family. Some people give a discount to industries in your areas, typically 10%. And that could be difficult if you have a lot. When I'm saying to you a 15% bottom line is getting to be healthy, that's the minimum place to be healthy if you're then discounting 10%. Here's how I feel about that. If the industry is doing something for you, let's say they're marketing to their team members, they're letting you set up a booth in the lunchroom, they're letting you hold a parenting class, then you're probably getting some exposure from them. Maybe they put your material in new employee packets. If they aren't doing anything for you, those people are probably going to come to you anyway. Do you need to provide that discount? I would think about it that way. Some people have to discount for subsidy families. So in some states, if you charge a lower, if you charge a higher tuition than the subsidy reimbursement, the agency will not allow you to charge the family the difference. So you just have to make that call. 
Sometimes it's an occupancy call and you just need to fill your school up. Sometimes you're going to be full anyway and you want to err on the side of families that can pay the full rate. In some places, you are allowed to charge the difference, but providers choose not to because their competition doesn't and they need to attract those families. So there are a lot of different ways to make that decision. The last one I want to talk about is one that has trended away and I want you to seriously consider removing for 2020 if you have not already. And that would be any days, free days, vacation days, any day that the family does not pay you for. So there is a huge industry trend away from this. And a great way that I heard a client explain this to a family was you rent an apartment, you go on vacation, do you get to skip rent for that week? Of course not. The apartment's still there. They can't move somebody else in for that week. The expenses go on. That rent is due. We're still here. Your teacher's getting paid. We're happy you're on vacation, but we don't allow free days. So this is also one you can grandfather, legacy, certain families, or you can say to families, based on rising cost, we need to go up in tuition $20 for the coming year. In order to support you, we're gonna go up $10 and we're gonna eliminate free days. They're kinda of happy right now, sounds good. Next summer, they're gonna forget and you're gonna to have to suffer through a year, but completely worth it. What, again, a very hidden danger when schools don't realize the impact of their discounting when they're counting heads and thinking about how full they are. So be very mindful of discounting. Great way to shore, shore up your financials. On our financial modeling, we continue to see credit card fees being charged to schools for parents to pay their tuition really increasing. So I'm a fan of allowing parents to use credit cards to pay their tuition for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, they love it because they want their points and it's a, it's a big expense for them, so it's meaningful. <laughs> I like it for you because although you have to set up a system and the fees are high, we see these fees go from two to $10,000 a year. My guess is you're spending that much in time and money personnel to chase payments. So also big trend in families that are able to pay online and there are usually fees associated with that too. So I think that those fees on your uh, expense side are well worth the lack of effort you have to make to collect your tuition. But we are seeing this, so it's either zero because a school doesn't take credit cards or allow online payments, or it can be a really big number. So just a trend, very little changes in our, I hope you guys find this as comforting as I do, that I first developed this model 34 years ago and only four things have changed in those 34 years. And they're minor. I find this really comforting. So the first two things that changed almost balanced each other out. We saw marketing expenses go down when we moved to things that were less expensive than yellow pages and billboards like social media. At the same time, we saw employee benefits go up because we had to attract employees. So not a huge overall impact. Today, we are watching credit card fees increase, and I'm encouraging, um, it's different in your state, find out whether you can pass that fee along. So in some states you can, in some states you can't, so know what you're doing there. The last thing is what we're having to pay new staff members coming in. That's where I'm pushy on this tuition rate increase, because if I'm telling you 45% is a healthy staff level when you're 70% full, you can't start paying them $20 more, I'm sorry, 20% more and not also go up a corresponding amount in your tuition. The math just doesn't work. It's not a thing. <coughs> and it will sneak up on you really quickly. Okay, so lots of growth. And we're going to hit this when we get over to transactions. A lot of new building going on, not just among the national groups. So of the national groups, kinder care is building 100 schools right now across the country. Learning care group, the La Petite family just launched a new brand. Well, not just, probably five or six years old now. 
called Everbrook. It's a STEM steam brand. And their construction is um, really crazy too. So they're going into new markets, uh, large regional groups, couple people with a couple of schools. There is a lot of new construction going on. And everyone loves what I call bright and shiny. Bright and shiny, new building, it's safe, it's pretty. So we are encouraging our clients to keep up with the investment in their school. You need to be able to compete when brand new comes to your market. So we'll talk about curriculum in a minute, but let's just talk about the way it looks. So the exterior of your building, your signage, your landscaping, um, the, the building itself is critical in attracting people into your building. <coughs> Once people come into your building, we're away from carpets now, unless they're on a limited basis. Uh, there are certain trends in flooring and lobbies and the way that they look and signage on classrooms and the mission uh, posted in a very professional way and, um, and you, get, you get it. So part of your facility is also an overall concept in branding. So we love our friends at Better Beans. They're here for the third year at Shift. They will do a talk on branding. They focus on the early education industry. Branding for them not only means how does it look and what are the colors, it means who are you, what do you believe in, how are you communicating that to families on the phone, on your website, on the internet, and your social media? Is your message consistent? How do you tour? <coughs> what does that person touring say? What do they highlight? How do you overall communicate to families who you are and what that means? How does your building look? What does your signage look like? And let me just go ahead and tell you, this is not cheap. It's not a cheap, if you have a building, I feel like buildings need to be rebranded and refreshed every 10 to 15 years. Yes, I do, in the 15 years. And it can be very expensive. So here are a couple of tips for that. <coughs> One tip is if you own your facility, maybe refinance, if you've got some equity, pull a little money out if you don't have the cash flow to fund it. If you have a landlord, ask your landlord to make that investment. I'll give you a great example. I own a couple of childcare buildings that I lease to other people. And two years ago, I got a call from one of them that said, we want to do a complete building refresh. We need $150,000. Will you give it to us? We'll pay you more rent. Cool, I'm happy you're investing in my building. I don't want to get a building back that looks like crap at the end of the 15 year lease. Because I had some equity in my mortgage, I went to the bank and said, can you add $150,000 to the mortgage? Sure, cool, here's your 150,000, now the rent increases. So that, both of those are great places to start. Borrowing money is e not easy, it's not, I don't think it's ever gonna be easy again, but it is um, not as challenging as it was about 10 years ago. So that's a great strategy for keeping your building relevant. <coughs> Consider coming to Shift and listening to the Better Beans guys and meeting them. Look at some of the work they're doing. Get plugged into their website. I mentioned them. I'm sure there are other resources. I mentioned them because they're the only ones I know that focus on our industry. It's Thad Joiner's company. We sold Thad's 12-site company in Atlanta, the Cadence Education, about six years ago, and he started Better Beans because he had a fabulous um, branding for his own schools. They're doing great work. Okay, we are seeing so much change in what I call sizzle. I'm calling it sizzle inflation. So sizzle to me is, you know, you guys are like me that you hear people in the industry sometimes say things like, oh, we're not babysitters like everyone else. We're special, we teach children. Well, maybe this is wrong, but what my head says immediately is, that doesn't make you special anymore. You have to teach children, that's the baseline. Licensing even requires that you teach the children. Maybe you're not implementing it well, and we all know people who, you know, maybe it's custodial, but in general, just teaching the children the basics does not make you special anymore. 
It does not differentiate you from bright and shiny coming into your market. It does not uh, entice parents. Parents want something that they can see as special for their children. So here's some ideas. <coughs> I mentioned the increase of brands that promote themselves as STEM and STEAM. And we have clients all the time that say to us, we've been doing STEM and STEAM for 30 years. Well, tell somebody. It's what I want to say. We're not, we're also our own worst enemies in doing great things and not communicating that well to our parents. So when a brand comes in like Everbrook that promotes themselves as a STEAM school and it looks techy and kind of cool, how do you compete against that? Maybe you have an, in, what they do is they have an interior room that you can see into and there are STEAM activities around the perimeter with an overhead projector with games and activities on the floor. Do you have a small area where you can also implement something like this? Communicate, communicate, communicate. We're also seeing the expansion of outdoor classrooms. I can't say I have that this year, but we did last year as one of our main stage speakers. We had Eric Nelson come and talk about the implementation of outdoor classrooms. I don't mean playgrounds. I mean the extension of the classroom into the outdoors. Here's the good news about it. It's healthy for children. You can do almost anything outdoors you can do indoors. And yes, in Minnesota, you can. You, and it's less expensive. So the implementation of a tinkering lab or a, I've seen a kitchen with children literally barefoot in the mud. I've seen music studios. I've seen lunch outside. I've seen napping outside. It's really, so our team will typically say there's no bad weather, there's bad clothing. So we believe, and most of the proponents believe that you can extend the classroom into the outdoors. It's a fabulous way to communicate the more healthy lifestyle and teaching methods to parents and very inexpensive to implement. We're seeing more broadly language immersion, foreign language immersion. So here's the distinction. We've been teaching foreign language for as long as, you know, I, I was a preschooler. And teaching foreign language means a foreign language teacher stands up and has the children recite their colors and numbers and we learn some words. Foreign language immersion means that at some point we transition, a teacher puts on a hat or a necklace and says, hola, and no other English is spoken for that time period. There are schools now that teach three or four languages. There are schools that teach <coughs> English for half a day and a second language for the second half of the day. There are a lot of different varieties around this but very popular, especially in areas where there's a very diverse population. <clears throat> we have, of course, had Montessori and Reggio in our markets for years, but they still, have <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, three days ago, there was no voice here. So I'm making progress, but not perfect. So although we've had Montessori and Reggio in our markets for years, they still have appeal to parents who want that style of teaching for their children. We have a fascinating speaker coming, um, Rebecca Amos from the Muse School in Calabasas, California, who changed her school to a sustainability plant-based diet school. She is gonna talk to us about that transition. Her sister, Susie Cameron, who's the wife of James Cameron, wrote a book called One Meal a Day, helping people to consider eating one plant-based meal a day and the profound effects on the environment if you do this. You guys might have seen Susie on Oprah's Super Soul Sunday recently talking about this. And um, she is bringing a copy of her book, I will tell you guys first, for each of our guests. So very generous of her. But immediately following Rebecca's um, shifter speech, we will all enjoy a plant-based lunch. So we're so excited about that as a new trend <coughs> and a differentiator. I think our millennial parent base 
understands the benefits of sustainability and a different type of eating much better than people like me that grew up with uh, things we thought were healthy and now we know are not. So that will be interesting. We're seeing, <coughs> we're seeing technology options explode. So the way you communicate with parents through technology with photos and information about their child's day, just communication in general, how you bill parents, how you enroll parents, how you connect with outside resources. And it's just constant <coughs> change in the technology. So we do have a, a technology provider who will speak a bit about some upcoming changes in their industry and uh, in their platform, which will be interesting. And then I just mentioned, and, and this is mainly technology, but how we reach today's parent groups and how we communicate. We spend a lot of time on this in our marketing. Molly Petchel from our team has a breakout on current marketing concepts and how to reach today's parent groups. So um, that would be a great thing to plug into. So sizzle inflation, sizzle curriculum. Okay, so that's what we see, what we hear from you guys, what we believe to be new trends. The world is moving very quickly. We want you guys to move with it. And so consider implementing, don't get overwhelmed with the 10 things. Choose the one thing that you think your team can wrap their head around. This is a great culture building concept too. Let them think about it, let them decide and let them help implement. Great way to do it. Now, what is the Hinge team seeing transactionally? Well, we gained more value for our customers in 2019 from selling their companies than twice as much as our most successful year. And that makes us so very happy for our clients who have worked hard to build a company and want to go out and, you know, maybe put their feet up for a little bit. And it makes us really happy to help them do that. The reason for that is that there has never been, and you, you guys have heard me say this for, this is probably the fifth year. And every year I think, hmm, it's gonna last another year. And there are predictions that it might not. But my prediction really is that we will continue to stay high for 2020. <coughs> And I think that's because we're all doing well economically. And I think that stability will continue. Just my opinion, nobody really knows. But here's what's happening in transactions. First of all, you guys heard me say it already, but I'm gonna say it again. We are seeing so much growth in the US in early education. So we increasingly are a darling industry among people who want to put their money to work somewhere. And there's still a lot of private individual money waiting on the sidelines for a place to put it. We have 300 private equity companies in our buyer database, either in the industry and wanting to grow or wanting to be in the industry. And so the competition for buyers for high quality assets is huge. The franchises are growing quickly. You heard me mention Primrose. We'll hear from Joe Kirshner at Shift. The national groups are growing. We talked about Kinder Care and Learning Care Group, our two largest companies. Also, Cadence Education will be there. We have a buyer panel this year that will consist of the CEO at Cadence, who is growing. Um, we put a Canadian um, company with backing from England into the US this year with a platform acquisition of 20 schools. Their CEO, Marianne Curran, will be speaking. We have um, Ron Packard, who was formerly Kinder Care and has started his own company and is growing. And then Andy Sherrod, who we love, who, whose company we sold two years ago and who was on our sellers panel last year and now is a buyer. So these guys will talk to you about why they want to invest in the industry, what they're looking for, what you need to know, how you position yourself. And also you can flip that around if you're a buyer too. How to look at a company that you want to buy, what should be important, how you transition it, and all the things that you need to know to do that very well. So we're, we're excited about that. Um, 
but lots of growth gets us back to competition and keeping yourself in sizzle inflation and relevant in branding. Okay, I mentioned that private equity continues to chase the industry. Our opening keynote after I kick us off is Phil um, Beccaro this year. Phil is with EY Parthenon, and we met when we both spoke at a capital market summit in New York last year. And Phil advises private equity groups on why and if they should invest in early education. So I invited Phil to come and talk to us about how private investors are looking at us as an industry, what they like about it, what they're concerned about, how we talk to them, how we use them as a resource if, if needed. So we're really excited to have him as one of our speakers this year. <coughs> so every year you've heard me say, I've never seen pricing for businesses so high, and I'm gonna say it again this year, because every year it has continued to surprise me. So here at Hinge, for most of our assets that we sell, we don't name asking prices anymore. We let the market determine the price because we continually get surprised. So we advise our sellers on what we believe might happen, but then we don't set pricing because we want to not leave money on the table, right? What you hate is I one time sold a house many, many years ago and someone gave me my asking price. And of course, what do I think right away? I didn't ask enough and we never want to do that. So we continue to see pricing increase for businesses. We saw the real estate pricing stabilize about two years ago and that continues. We haven't seen it go down or go up. It's stable, we can depend on it. We have institutional buyers for real estate. We'll talk a little bit more about that in, in just a second, but it's definitely a seller's market. Makes it really tough if you're on the buy side because there's so much aggression and high prices being paid for assets, especially really strong, high quality assets. <coughs> I mentioned more options for real estate funding and the fact that they had stabilized. So this continues to surprise us as well. So over the course of the life of a business, business owners will typically go to conventional. So I actually started SBA financing for real estate first. I still love SBA financing, mainly because your down payment can be much lower. It's very bureaucratic. It used to be more bureaucratic than conventional financing, but I don't think so much anymore because conventional financing is very bureaucratic now too. So, but they both are lending. So um, go SBA first, but down less money, go to conventional second, where you can typically get a lower interest rate, when uh, this continues to surprise us, <coughs> but we work with the REIT community, R-E-I-T, <coughs> Real Estate Investment Trust, which is what private equity is to business. So it's private individuals' money that invest only in real estate. <coughs> and there are several of those in the U.S. that we bring in to purchase real estate assets to help our clients grow. If they don't have the funds to pay for real estate, they can become the landlord and then lease it back. They're mainly interested in the cash flow model of the school that they will be the landlord in, much less interested in the actual real estate than the fact that the school can pay the rent. It used to be that the threshold for getting this type of investment was a pretty large company, and it got down to 10 sites, and it got down to five, and then two years ago, we, um, we actually are doing a deal right now with somebody with one school. So who knows where that will go. But at this point, we throw almost anything up just to see what's happening and um, what we can make work for our clients. So m many more options for real estate financing for growth. So that's good news if you're in growth mode. Okay, that's what we think is happening. Um, put your questions in, hover over the top bar. I'm gonna um, tell you a couple more things. Again, hover over the top of your panel bar. I think we have about five minutes, so we can take at least a couple of questions. Um, I do want to um, 
let you guys know again while you're doing that, that because of our shift two and a half day conference, go to, if I didn't say it, shiftchildcareleaders.com if you want to register. If it doesn't let you, it's we're pretty close to capacity. But call me and let me put you on the list because just today somebody said I can't come, got a family illness. And, um, you know, it really does happen as we get closer to time that we can free up a seat or two for people. So we got a couple of questions in here. <clears throat> ah, great question. How is the uh, increasing minimum wage expected to impact the childcare industry? Well, we have this going on right now in many states. We have clients who are implementing over several years um, to, you know, from things like $10 to $15 an hour. So there's some pretty huge increases. We believe that you have to make a um, strong plan to match your tuition rates up to the increase. And historically, so again, in my 34 years, I've been through a lot of minimum wage increases. And historically, I have found that when you communicate to parents the need for a tuition rate increase to match a minimum wage increase and explain to them that that doesn't mean that you pay everyone minimum wage. It means that you then have to increase everyone, that it's typically very easy to sell that to families. They expect it, they know it's coming. You might lose a family or two, but it's just absolutely necessary. So the industry will be impacted if it does not correspond with a healthy tuition rate increase. Where I've seen it implemented in a healthy way has been fine. As a matter of fact, I've got some clients who feel like their financial picture will be better off at the end of the three year implementation. And we've worked with a couple of people to help set those bars and help them figure it out. That's the only answer I have for you. I wish I had one more clever. And if one of you guys has one, has one, I'd love to hear it. But I think it just makes that more critical. And of course, again, discounting can help toward that as well. Do you think that the national conversation about universal childcare work will persuade lawmakers to invest in publicly funded programs that will affect childcare business owners? Absolutely. Um, I do. But also, I like the efforts that are going on. And again, big focus at our conference. I like the efforts that are going on to get people more involved, the work that ECEC is doing, to be sure that you have the ability to participate. I don't think that there's a question about whether public dollars will continue to invest in early education. To me, the question is, can you participate? Can you participate? So will you lose that or can you participate? You have to put yourself out there and, um, and really be able to gain those dollars too. Um, how do I learn more about how to use the revenue sources? Um, so, Revenue sources, I'm assuming you mean the ones that we mentioned, which are the Head Start and the um, Child Development Block Grant. Uh, reach out to us. We might not be the expert in um, each local market, but we can probably help you get connected to the right person. So reach out. I'm not sure we're the right resource to tell you exactly how to get plugged in but we can certainly give you financial benchmarks that would make it work for you and try to get you connected. Do REITs ever finance public charter schools with or without preschools? Absolutely, they love charter schools. And most of the funding we're talking about is being invested in the charter school community. So yes, equally, maybe more. I mean, they love the charter world. We haven't yet worked in that community, although we've talked about it, we just don't, have the bandwidth. There's so much that goes on in, in just our early education right now. And one more, I think we have one minute. In my market, we've noticed that enrollment takes longer 
than to enroll families in field schools at the beginning of the school year. Other owners in Miami experiencing same. I'm curious, is it happening in other markets? If so, why could be the reason? Um, I did very in a limited way hear a little bit more of that this year than I typically do that the fall didn't seem to um, go uh, as strongly as it did in the past. Um, I'm not sure that I've heard it enough for me to have asked enough questions to find out why, but I would say yes, I have heard that. Uh, but good question, Jennifer, and I'll ask more questions. And I am gonna take one more. Pam says she just registered for the conference and the venue is, uh, there are no more hinge rooms, is what I'm guessing that you're saying. Let me check on that. We did hold a block of rooms, Pam, and uh, we could be sold out. And I hope that we're not, but send me an email. Let me get Jacqueline, who manages our events, to find out the answer to that and we can communicate it out. I know we had a lot of um, new guests register in the last week, and I thought we were probably pretty close to capacity, but we will find a way for you to join us, Pam. Uh, anyone else needing resources for that, certainly let me know. This has been a great uh, masterclass, one of my favorites. Thank you for the great questions. Thank you for the large crowd. We hope to see as many of you guys as possible at SHIFT and look forward to talking to you more throughout 2020 about what is essential for you to know in your business. Take care and be well, friends.